Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have a confession to make. The struggle is real. This past week, I have wrestled and struggled and had many sleepless nights because of this sermon. I chose this topic to preach on because we live in a violent world, and I personally find it very challenging at times to know how to respond. It often feels as if life is one violent wave after another that comes crashing down on us. We barely manage to break the surface and gasp for a breath of air before another wave hits. I want to just read you a few headlines um, from the news this past week. Police attempt to subdue protests in Cologne, Germany with pepper spray. Protesters were angry about a spate of sexual assaults and robberies during New Year's Eve festivity. 31 people, most of them from North African and Middle Eastern countries, have been charged in the attacks. And this fuels a political firestorm over immigration in Germany. About 500 of the approximately 1,700 protesters supported Pegida, an organization that opposes immigration of Muslims from the Middle East. Israeli military claims it carried out airstrikes against a group of Gaza militants placing explosives along the border. A suicide bomber in Istanbul's Sultanahmet Square killed 10 people. Police claim bomber belonged to ISIS militant group. Airstrikes as part of Syria's civil war hit a kindergarten. Police officer Jesse Hartnett was sitting in his police cruiser in Philadelphia when he was shot three times by a man. I could have listed <laughs> twice as many violent news stories in my sermon. That's just a few of them that happened just in this past week. So it's no wonder that we are unsure how to respond. We don't even have time to process one event that happens before another has already happened. And those are just the large-scale, overt acts of violence. Violence also happens in much more subtle ways in our own lives. The Psych Central website defines aggression. I couldn't find a definition for violence. I could only find one for aggression. And it says this, behavior which attacks, threatens, intimidates, or otherwise intends harm may be physical, mental, or verbal. We live, friends, in a society in which acts of aggression committed against individuals or certain segments of our population are so common that they seem normal to us. People are stopped for walking or driving down the street for no reason other than the color of their skin. We make assumptions about people based on their race, like what language an individual speaks or what kind of music she listens to. We listen to political debates in which very few concrete ideas and solutions are discussed. And instead, opinion uh, opponents are belittled, which happens on both sides of the aisle. Now, I had a whole list of examples that I was going to read to you of things that politicians have said in the past month that were just awful, awful, but I decided I don't want to give them any more airspace than they've already had, so I'm not going to read them to you. You probably have heard them all anyway. There are also acts of violence that happen between individuals. Maybe you get into a fight at school. Maybe someone assaults you at a bar or when you're walking on the street. Maybe a spouse or a parent occasionally hits you or someone tells you frequently that you aren't smart enough or aren't from the right family or from the right part of town or aren't the right gender. That old adage that you learn in elementary school, sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me, just isn't true. We all know that words cut deep especially when they attack our personal identity and our self-worth. And that is in, it, is in of itself a type of violence. There are so many different types of violence that exist in our world today. So needless to say, a sermon talking about a Christian response to violence could go in a lot of different directions. And I think that's part of what paralyzed me this week. No one sermon could ever cover it all. Even a sermon series devoted just to this topic couldn't cover it all. As we think about how we are to respond to the violence in our world, there are a lot of things to consider. Like how do we as individuals respond and how might that be different from how we as a group, whether that's a group of friends or a neighborhood or a church or a country, would be called to respond. It also affects things like who we might call to help us in times of trouble. 
For instance, if we claim a position of complete pacifism, that is no response to violence at all, no violent acts, then if someone is threatening us or our family, we would have to think twice about whether or not to call the police, who, after all, are authorized to use force on our behalf, whether we want them to or not. We have to consider things like, is it okay to use violence in self-defense or to defend those who are powerless? We have to ask questions like, where does the value or sacredness of life come from, and is the value diminished by bad behavior? And what do we do when two lives are weighed against each other? And how does our response vary if it's physical violence or emotional violence? This whole issue is so complicated that there is now an entire field of Christian ethics devoted solely to how we respond to violence. When we look at the Bible and how violence is treated and used just within the pages of scripture, it's just as conflicting and just as confusing. We have passages that seem to be divine-sanctioned genocide, or passages like the one Chandra read from Deuteronomy about an eye for an eye, or the passages that demand physical violence in response to breaking the law. And then there are passages like Jesus saying those without sin are to cast the first stone or turn the other cheek or his example for us of going to the cross rather than using violence to combat those who would injure and eventually kill him. Throughout the centuries, we have had many theologians and church fathers subject varying responses to violence. There were popes who sanctioned the Crusades. There's Thomas Aquinas who named the just war theory, which is saying that there are a few limited circumstances in which violence is acceptable. And there's people like Thomas Merton, who is a complete pacifist, would not even call the police if someone had uh, robbed him or beaten him up, and believes that Christians should never, ever, ever use violence. Now, it might be tempting for us to look at Jesus' life and think that Jesus lived in a less violent world than we do, so he couldn't know how to respond. But that's just not the case. Jewish people in Jesus' time lived under foreign occupation. That means there were a handful of very rich people, but the masses, the most majority of people, were increasingly poor and in debt. The poor were heavily taxed, both by secular and religious authorities. They were often exposed to exploitation and debt bondage by state bureaucrats and wealthy creditors. They lived in a situation of increasing crime, family breakdown, environmental stress, and untreatable diseases. Does that sound familiar at all? The poor, the many, bore the brunt of Rome's humiliating and brutal military occupation. In many places, <clears throat> excuse me, in many places that Rome occupied, they didn't feel the need to send their legions of soldiers to physically occupy their conquered territories because instead they used efficient laws and economic pressure on whatever the territory was and military bases maybe just right outside of that territory, all in conjunction as deter deterrent forces. But in Palestine, because of its constant volatility, Roman legions were a constant present under the guise of being peacekeepers. Between 4 BCE, when Herod the Great died, remember Herod the Great is the one um, that they make the joke about that it's better to be one of his pigs than one of his sons because he killed his son but wouldn't kill and eat a pig. Between 4 BCE when he died and the first destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE, Israel was racked by repeated religious revolts, violent messianic movements, political assassinations, insurgency, and counterinsurgency warfare. In Jesus' time, the Jewish people faced routine harassment, violence, and humiliation by the Roman soldiers. So what that means is that the primary concern for Jews in Jesus' day wasn't issues of theology, but rather liberation from oppression, from debt in all of its form, from those who occupied them, from Rome. Theologian N.T. Wright says it this way, The burning question on people's minds was how will God act? in history, to save the chosen people from their enemies, both within and without. And each individual's answer to this question showed one's political ideology. And your politics revealed your theology, because your politics and your theology were so intertwined.
So as a result, in first century Palestine, there were four ways of responding to violence that emerged. So as we look at each of these four ways, I want to suggest that these four ways are still used by us today. The first was the way of the Herodians. Think Herodians, think people like um, Herod the Great. The Herodians were the administrators of Judea on behalf of Rome. So Herod the Great was the governor of Judea, but he was the governor of Judea because Rome said that he could be. These people were viewed as traitors and collaborators by everyone else. They have been described as a gang of priest pretenders whose piety was not so much suspect as non-existent. But even more than that, the Herodians were intelligent planners and they were men who understood the balance of power. Their moral assumption was that people needed to face up to reality. When you cannot achieve your ideals, they said, you must learn to work within the realm of the possible to form unpleasant alliances if necessary and to accept that your hands are just going to be dirty. So a modern day example of this would be people who just throw their hands in the air and say, well, this is the way things are, so I might as well live within the rules of society. The second way to respond to violence was the withdrawal of the Essenes. The Essenes were a group of faithful Jews who believed wholeheartedly that eventually the Messiah would come and set things right, and that there would be this great big battle in the end, and that they, the Essenes, would be, uh, would be taken um, up with the Messiah. So their job in the meantime was to live as holy and pious a life as possible. So what they did is they withdrew from society and they went and bought, uh, built themselves their own little town and they became cloistered and avoided those that seemed to be unpious because they did not want to be drawn into sinful behavior. Now, interestingly enough, just as an aside, um, the Essenes believed that women in general were unholy, that you could only be a brother of the light, you can be a sister of the light. So they wanted to grow their Essene population, but they did not let women in to the area where they cloistered themselves, which makes no sense at all. So the Essenes withdrew away, and living away from society as a whole meant that they did not participate in any armed revolts of political agitation against Roman authorities. They just sat in their cloistered environment and waited for the Messiah to come. But in many ways, silence and withdrawal are themselves highly political acts, often with devastating consequences for others. So a modern day example of this would be Christians that try to live their whole lives in a Christian bubble. And what I mean by that are folks who only have Christian friends, only listen to Christian radio, avoid any contact, any activity that might be reviewed as even remotely questionable. Anytime we feel within ourselves this desire to circle the wagons, to protect ourselves and the church from outside influences, and to leave the world to its own devices, we are probably responding a little bit like the Essenes did. The third way is the way of the Pharisees. Now, there were two different groups of Pharisees who responded two different ways to violence. The first group followed a rabbi named Rabbi Hillel, who sought to avoid direct confrontation with Rome. These folks emphasized Torah study, religious purity, and political prudence. They sought to strengthen Jewish piety and purity and resisted Roman oppression only when absolute essentials of the faith were at stake. Probably most Christians today fall into this kind of category. We work to be faithful to God, studying so that we can grow in our understanding and trying to stay out of the political firestorms that spring up around us. Most of us only get involved when we feel like the absolute essentials of our faith are at stake. The fourth way is the way of the second group of Pharisees. This group followed a rabbi named Shammai, and he urged immediate and violent revolt against Rome. This is a quote from a historian. This revolutionary zeal was especially appealing to marginalized Jews living outside of the major centers of power, rural people in underdeveloped regions like Galilee, who fueled the economic dynamism of the empire by providing cheap labor and raw, good for, raw goods for exports. That description describes fully half of Jesus' disciples. Half of Jesus' disciples were probably students of this rabbi, belonged to this second group, who wanted an immediate and violent revolt against Rome. So a modern day example of this would be um, like Jerry Falwell Jr., the president of Liberty, Liberty University, a Christian college in Virginia, who suggested that all of the student body should arm themselves and carry concealed weapons. <laughs> 
This is the environment in which Jesus lived and taught. And as is typical of Jesus, he suggests an alternative way for us, a fifth way. Our gospel passage this morning gives us a good place to start in coming to understand this fifth way. This section of the Sermon on the Mount is often referred to as the Beatitudes, and it's probably at least vaguely familiar to most of you. To the first hearers of this message from Jesus, these words would have sounded radical and even subversive. In some ways, I think we have to re retrain our ears because we are so used to hearing these words that we've slightly watered them down. We hear, blessed are the meek or blessed are the merciful, and it doesn't have the same kind of punch to our ears that it would have had to those in Jesus' day. Theologian and writer Thomas Merton says it this way, this does not mean blessed are they who are endowed with a tranquil natural temperament, who are not easily moved to anger, who are always quiet and obedient, who do not naturally resist. Still less does it mean blessed are they who passively submit without protest to unjust oppression. That's usually what we hear. But Jesus is making a much more radical statement than that. He's saying, when the world tells you an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, when the world tells you to take revenge and fight back against your oppressor, I'm saying it is better for you to be merciful to those who hurt you. It is better to be meek and to seek peace. And those are hard words to hear for a people who were constantly in the throes of violent acts. So to say to these folks, blessed are the peacemakers, was really a radical call to something new. Jesus says in verse 17 that he didn't come to abolish the law or to overturn it, but to fulfill it. And that's true. You can hear that in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. He's not so much overturning the Torah requirements as he is intensifying its demands. So instead of prohibiting murder like the Torah does, Jesus goes further and prohibits anger. Instead of prohibiting adultery, he prohibits even lust. And this is true except when it comes to violence. Because here, he radically alters and even in some places overturns what the Torah says. We heard the Torah this morning in our passage from Deuteronomy. It says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It may not seem like it to us, but this command was a way of limiting violence. It was a way of assuring that the retribution was not greater than the crime itself. So if somebody took an eye, all you could take was an eye. You couldn't take an eye and a leg, right? It limited the amount. But Jesus says, do not resist an evil person. What he is saying is that the basic belief that has held them in this endless cycle of violence upon violence upon violence does not work. He's saying we need to make a new choice if we want the world to change. Theologian Ronald E. Osborne says it this way, by exemplifying the peaceableness and conciliatory spirit of the Beatitudes, the believer confounds and shames the aggressor, creating an opportunity for the violent person to be reconciled with God. By absorbing undeserved suffering and not retaliating in kind, the disciple also destroys the evil inherent in the logic of force. Instead of an endless cycle of violence and recrimination, there is shalom, there is God's peace. Now I want to just take a minute and speak a word about cycles of domestic violence and Jesus' call for us to be meek peacemakers. Because I want to be clear that while I am saying we have to look deeply at our first instinct, instinct to retaliate back or fight back when someone hurts us, I don't think this would be Jesus' answer for a situation like domestic violence. In these cases, I don't think Christ would say to stay in the marriage or turn the other cheek or that this is your cross to bear like has sometimes been the message from the church. If we look at Jesus' other statements and actions to help us understand this call for us to be peacemakers, we would see that throughout the New Testament, Jesus says that he wants us to have abundant life, and he works at every opportunity for justice over and over again. 
He calls the lepers who've been abused by society and gives them a new life. He gives actual food to hungry people and spiritual drink to those who feel abandoned by God. He heals and heals and heals and then heals some more. He stops what could be a stoning of a woman caught in adultery. Jesus wants us all to be in relationships that are life-giving and justice-filled, and nothing less than that is acceptable to God. So if you are being abused by anyone, you do not have to stay in that relationship. Get help. Tell someone. Come find Pastor Bill or I. As a family member of one who was abused brutally by her husband, I know that God wants more for all of us. Now, the call to be peacemakers comes into play in that my family members and I cannot run after my sister's husband and give him the same treatment that he gave to my sister, even though there are days and moments when all of us would like to do so. We are called to keep her safe and to work for legal justice for her. But we are not to use our strength and might to fight him, and that is hard. But much of what Jesus calls us to do is hard. It is countercultural and even in some cases counter to our human nature. But God calls us to do the extraordinary, to go the extra mile. And that's, I think, what Jesus was telling his disciples and those who were gathered around that day during the Sermon on the Mount. He was saying to them, I know you are weary of being abused by the Romans. I know that we are a weary people who've been taken advantage of by other major powers over and over and over. I know that you want to rise up and fight a battle and win back your freedom, but God wants more for you. God wants you to be a people who seek not just retaliation, but justice, not not just revenge, but peace. I think ultimately that's what Jesus is telling us, that Jesus came so that we could all have life and have it abundantly, that violence is not justifiable nearly as often as we think it is, that if we want to be peacemakers, then we cannot subscribe to the logic of force that tells us we can scare people into a particular behavior or use violence as a way of controlling people. Instead, we must work to address the underlying issues behind the violence. We must work for a world in which people, all people, are valued. We must work for a world in which people are healed and hungry people are fed, a world in which everyone has a place to belong and is accepted and loved. That's what Jesus means when he says to love your enemy. He means rather than turning around and pummeling the person who just pummeled you, you should try to figure out what they need in order to live a whole life. It means working for their good even when they don't do the same for you. The prophet Micah says in one of my favorite passages, names that there will come a day when God will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. It's a beautiful vision, but it is also one that feels, at least to me, next to impossible. And it is impossible on our own. But we can't live into that vision or ever hope to be a part of that kind of world if we don't constantly keep that vision, that goal, out in front of us. If we don't pray for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. If we don't remind ourselves and those around us that there is a better way to live, better choices that we can make. And that means starting in small ways. It means making sure that our own actions, big and small, are not violent. That the way we talk to our children, our friends, our family is loving and kind and peacemaking. It means making sure that in small ways, we begin to choose peace instead of revenge, so that when the big times come, we are prepared to make the hard choices. It means wrestling with this, struggling with it, until God makes a new way for us. I want you to close your eyes and listen to the Beatitudes one more time, this time in the message translation. Hear them as a prayer for Christ to make this true in each of us. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. 
You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He is food and drink in the best meal you've ever eaten. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens, give a cheer even, for though they don't like it, I do, and all heaven applauds, and know that you are in good company. You are with Jesus. May it be so for each one of us, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.